the earth. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I will talk about domain specific languages of mathematics. And uh, that's both a, a research project and a course. And uh, since a year back, also a book. So first, a little bit about me, myself. So I'm a computer scientist, a professor at Charmus University of Technology. I'm a Haskell hacker. Haskell is a functional programming language that you will see a bit of in this mini course. I like to connect uh, the big picture with formal details um, in language technology. I worked on, on uh, proving, uh, so formal proofs in uh, another language called Agda. But also on the applied side on climate impact research together with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. I worked on parametricity, testing, parsing, programming, and then most relevant for this talk, domain specific languages of mathematics. So now what is that? Um, well, first, as I mentioned, there is a book. It's the front page is on the left. I am the main author and I got two co-authors. It's also the course literature for a seven and a half credit course at Chalmers and University of Gothenburg. And the main idea is to encourage the students to approach mathematical domains from a functional programming perspective. And we'll see more of what that actually means later. And um, students will learn about the language Haskell, identifying main functions and types involved in different mathematical concepts, introduce calculational proofs, pay attention to syntax, semantics, and organizing the results in what is called the domain-specific languages. And the mini course today and tomorrow gives a bit of a teaser, some functional programming in Haskell and a few examples of lectures from the course. And clearly, um, eight week course cannot be crammed into three one hour lectures. So uh, if things are uh, difficult, then just ask and I will just slow it down and make sure uh, that we get through at least some parts with a good understanding. So clearly the concept of a domain specific language abbreviated DSL is central here. And uh, one usually says that the DSL has four components a surface syntax, so the, the sort of the words and the grammar of the of the language. And that's mostly ignored in this course. But the, formally, it's a set of strings defined by some grammar, the things you can write. Um, the next level down is the so-called abstract syntax. That's usually implemented as a recursive data type of syntax tree. Um, and then there is a semantic type, the thing that the language is supposed to describe. And you can model that as a type or a set of values for the syntax. So semantics means meaning. And then the actual semantics is a function, a normal mathematical function, usually called eval for evaluation, that takes the abstract syntax to the semantics. And to make it slightly more concrete, uh, here are three examples. The first is date expressions. So 2023-08-30 or the last Wednesday in August or today are all strings. So surface syntax for, well, today. And uh, you could, in many computer applications, you need to handle dates and expressions involving dates. And that means that you need to be able to implement these. You need to define formally what they mean, what the semantics is. And uh, it's worth noting that it's clear from, for example, today or the last Wednesday in August, that they cannot be defined without some context. So today is not a fixed date. It's always, it can be implemented as a function from a current date to some, uh, the date you mean. So the last Wednesday in August, for example, will be different times depending on which year you're in. Okay, uh, next example, language or category domain that you can code up is uh, Excel sheet formulas. 
So if you haven't worked with Excel, here are some examples. The sum of the cells A1 through A9, or the right part of the left part of cell C7, if you want to do some string calculations and so on. That's also a specific domain. And the semantics there is perhaps a function from a, an array of cells into the value of the cells. Um, then first order logic. Um, then you have expressions like P implies Q or for all epsilon, there exists a delta such that, for example, here, epsilon is bigger than delta, which is true, but not very interesting, perhaps. And those kinds of uh, expressions also form a language, a domain-specific language for logic. And then you can uh, have the semantics as truth values. OK. Um, and the mini course overview, this is just an intro here, say is then a short introduction to what one might call type-driven development. You might have heard about test-driven development. So you start with writing some test cases, you want to implement something, and then you start filling in code and you continuously check if the code actually satisfies those tests. And here I'm trying to start with writing a type, which is something that a compiler can automatically check if the program satisfies. And that takes us, takes us to the domain of typed functional programming, where the language Haskell I will use is a prime example. It's a very nice language. It's been around for 30 years, but it's a very modern language nevertheless. I will talk about function types, polymorphism and function composition, pair types, and this type-driven development, and also what's called sum types, which are not as common as, as the product type of pair types. Uh, and then I will also give some uh, another kind of examples where in the course, we often come back to some course book, some mathematics book, and take a quote and try to analyze it very carefully. Like the, the, the devil reads the Bible, you sometimes says, and it's like trying to see exactly what's written and what does it mean and can we code it up? And uh, the first example there is on complex numbers. Um, and there we... Okay, now it's in progress again. That's good. <laughs> okay, so hopefully uh, you can now see um, a um, an editor window. On the left hand side is some text, and on the right hand side is mostly empty. It's basically a a, a strong calculator, and that's the interpreter for the language Haskell. Um. And uh, well, you see, I, I've written one plus two there and then returned three. And I should ask at this point, can you see or is the font size far too small? So if somebody would be daring enough to write something in the chat or say that it's okay or that I should increase. Okay, somebody says it's okay, then I'll, I'll hope that you complain if you think otherwise. So first of all, I'm using something called literate programming. Literate programming, oops. Which has been around since the 70s or so. Uh, it means that anything I write outside code blocks is a comment. So this part is a comment, and then it says begin code, and then there is some code and end code, and then it's comment again. So I can say comment again down here. So um, that's just to make sure that there is plenty of space for explaining the code and not only uh, typing code. And this first code block is something I will actually not really explain. I would just say that it's part of uh, the kind of 
first few lines of a file that you would have to add to if you have certain requirements on what you want to import and what you want to use and so on. So I will now hide that part and focus on starting slowly with some test functions. So this um, part here is going to introduce some of the concept of the functional programming language Haskell. And functional, I should say functional programming language. Uh, functional means it's based on functions. Um, and based on functions means that we really have to experiment with what functions can do. So F1 here is a function and it's colon colon says this means, I can say here, means has type. So this f1 has type int arrow bool, meaning it takes an integer as an input and returns a boolean as the output. Whoops, now I'm accidentally moved to the end of the whole file. I'm back here, f1. Okay, now I'm on the right hand side and seeing, okay, f1 applied to seven. And that says false, why? Well, because I defined f1 to be the predicate even. It's a built-in function in the Haskell prelude. It checks if an integer is even or odd. Um, I wrote here f1 parentheses, seven end parentheses, because that's the usual way functions are written in math books. But function application is so common in Haskell that you don't actually have to write the parentheses. So f1 of seven works just as well. And if we want to try F1 on six, then it says true, not very surprisingly, zero is also true and so on. Okay, another function, and I, I should also mention I have indented, I added spaces here just to show that there is something matching between F1 and F2. So F2 is a function that produces an integer. So this is a consumes an int and this function produces an int. And if I want to use F2 on uh, 3.14, for example, I will get three. It just rounds it. And that's the definition here, assessing me. F2 equals round. I should also note that I can write F2 equals round. I don't have to say F2 of X equals round of X. I can work on the level of functions. I can give names to functions. I can pass them around and work with them. So that's one of the features of functional programming. So it's rounding. So if I say instead 3.85, I would get four. Okay, and then as a last example of this very basic intro, let's see, can we combine F1 and F2? So get from a double all the way to a Boolean. It may be not a very useful function, but the intention is to first round the number and then check if the result was even. So here it says error to do. So this is a complete definition, but not a very useful definition. If I say F3 of 3.14, it will say exception to do blah, blah, blah. So uh, Clearly, I need to replace this with some implementation. And the comment here says I should combine F with F1 with F2. So now there are different ways of doing this. And uh, the simplest way is saying, OK, F3 takes an argument, which is a double. Let's call that number x. And F3 applied to x should then be, well, according to the type, a Boolean. So true or false. Uh, the way we can construct a Boolean is by using one. So let's say, okay, this is F1 of, and then some, some question mark. Well, what question mark? Well, we have to use F2 to get an integer. So let's use F2 and that we apply to X. So here I've used parentheses. I said before, I don't need them when function application, but I do need them when it becomes ambiguous. If I wouldn't use parentheses here, it wouldn't be clear what F1 was applied to. So F1, the function, should be applied to the result of applying F2 to X. Okay, let's try this one. So F3 on 3.14 is false. So why is it false? Well, first, it rounds it. It uses the rounding function. 
and then it checks if the result is even. And the rounded 3.14 is 3, which is odd, so it's not even. Okay. Um, I should also mention one more thing, and that is anonym, anonymous function expression. As functions are so important, it's actually possible to write functions without naming them immediately. So this is also called the lambda expression. And the syntax is you have a, a backslash and then a variable like x and then an arrow and then an expression. And in this case, for example, f3 here, you can say, well, f3 is equal to the lambda expression that takes an x and returns f1 of f2 of x. So this is the same function as before. I can still call it on 3.14 or 3.85 or whatever. But I can now uh, calculate with functions a little bit easier. So if f3 is used somewhere, I can replace the use of f3 with this function. Um, I should also mention that Haskell is not just a functional programming language. It's a pure functional programming language. And pure here means means no side effects. So what, what is an example of a side effect? Well, printing or parsing or random number generation and so on are side effects. And you might then think that, oh, we can't do any of those. But you can. It's just... Uh, requires a bit of care and, and some other types that I will not go through today. But an example of, a, of something which is not a function in Haskell is if we say uh, random, and we say that random would be something that takes a natural number and gives another natural number with the idea that random six uh, would, give, would give a number between zero and five, a random number. So that's a function that's available. Maybe you would usually write it like this in some other language. It's, it's often available, but the problem is that this is not really a function in the mathematical sense. Because if I call random six two different times, I can get different results, but the function cannot ever give different results for the same input. So random of six could be equal to two, and then the next call of random of six could be equal to five. But two is not equal to five. So there's sort of <laughs> error. There's, there's something bad happening there. So random there would be a side affecting function. And that's something that uh, is not um, allowed in this type system. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, good. Okay, squaring. That's a, a, a simple function that might be useful just to implement something ourselves. So x to the power of 2. Um, Square of 3 is 9, square of 17 is 289, and so on. So this shows that if we want to implement simple mathematical functions, it's, uh, well, it's almost directly math, math syntax. We might have a function g of x, which is 1 plus x, uh, 1 plus 2 times x plus x squared, for example. And then g of 3 would be 1 plus 2 times 3, which is 7, plus 9, which is then 16. Okay, and if you want to exemplify these lambda expressions again, this could be written lambda x arrow, and this could be written lambda x arrow. And notice I say lambda is <laughs> approximated. I should say it probably ASCII approximated by the backslash and not the Greek uh, lowercase lambda. Okay, that was the 
simple examples of functions, now to some type-driven development. So here I want to use what is called parametrically polymorphic types to guide the implementation. And I should say that the functions I define here are sort of trivial functions. They are, uh, but they are still useful, and especially they are useful for illustrating the point. So the first function I'm going to define is called id. Id, id for identity. So the identity function takes an argument and returns the same value. So it sort of doesn't do anything. And uh, it's defined here as just error, which we clearly have to replace. But it is a function. And any function, then we have to say it takes an argument x. Or we could define this as a lambda expression. And then we have to return something. And now we can start thinking, what type is the result? So the type signature here says a to a. And that really means for all types a take an input of that type and return i should continue here i guess an answer of that same type so we don't know though when we implement this what type a is and that has very strong implications we cannot return three, for example, here. If you would try, Haskell would complain and say, well, there's something fishy going on. Uh, we can't return a string uh, similarly. Um, we really have only one choice of a correct value to return here, and that's x. So we have x of type A. And if I sort of indent a bit, you can see, so x is of type A and we return x of type A. So that's the only type correct and the complete definition of the identity function that we can produce. And now, of course, if you want to run this definition, it's not very interesting. We say identity of three, that's three. Identity of seven is seven. But one thing is interesting, and that's that we can apply it to other kinds of things as well. The identity of hello is hello. The identity of identity, well, it's the same function, identity again. So I guess identity of identity of hello is hello. We can apply identity to anything, a pair of a number and a Boolean value or whatever. So the type polymorphism here, polymorphic is between many forms, means that it's the input to the identity function can have many different forms. And the whatever it has, it will return the same result. Um, OK, now to const, the function const. And already given the type here, we have to understand what a and b mean. So a and b are two arbitrary types. So we don't know what a is and what b is, and the function definition must work whatever a and b we put in. But it is a function from the value a, and it returns a function from a value of type b. So we can start saying, OK, let's assume we got an x. That's a good starting point. x is of type a, and then we have to return a function. So let's write a function here, lambda y arrow then it's a question, what can we put in here? So at this position here, we have to have, we need a value of type A. So the first thing we can try, which will not work, but just to illustrate it, is to return Y. And then it will say, well, we give a long error message saying, basically, you couldn't match type A with actual type B. So you tried to return a value of type B, but you needed something of type A. So the only thing we have of type A is X. OK, now it does work. So we defined a function here, const, which takes a value and then returns another function. So it's um, 
if we try to use it, we can say const two. Well, const two is still a function, so we have to apply this function to another argument. Const two applied to hello, for example, and that will return two. And actually, it will throw away whatever we write here. So we can even say error, don't touch, and it will still return two. And this is an illustration of what is called laziness. Laziness. So Haskell is a lazy programming language, meaning it doesn't evaluate things until, until they are needed. So here is an example. The error message here would be printed, don't touch would be printed if it actually needed its second argument to const. But the function const takes x, it takes y, and returns x. It never even touches y. And that means we can get around using it without um, evaluating the second arm argument. OK, so these functions are sort of boring functions here in const. And this dot, which stands for function composition, is actually a really useful tool. And it has a little bit more complicated type. So first, we can dig into the type a little bit by erasing some parts. So there is something to something to something. So it has two arguments, this one and this, and then returns something else. But the two arguments it gets in are actually functions. So it's a higher order function. Dot is a higher order function. A function taking functions as arguments. That's usually called an operator in maths. Uh, but it's in Haskell, it's just an, an ordinary function with a special type. And the other thing is that I've written parentheses around the dot here. And that's because uh, if I use operator characters like plus and dot and minus and so on, I can use the function infix. So the function is called dot and it can be used between its two arguments. So if I say f dot g, now that is calling the function dot with two arguments, one called f and the other called g. So here is then the, the stage where we're going to have to fill in um, a function from a to c. And it's interesting that I, I, I said informally that this should be function composition. You should compose two functions together. But I haven't really meant, said what that means. But given the type, this polymorphic type, there is actually no choice but to do the right thing. So let's explore that further. So first, what is the type of the result? So the result here, maybe we can call it foo. And then we can say where foo equals something. So foo has type A arrow C. And that means that, well, foo is a function. It takes some X input and it returns some value of type C output. And we know that X is of type A. But we, we have to produce a value of type C and the only producer of C's is this function, the first argument to the composition. So F, because we know that F has type B to C. Maybe I should indent this. So we can try to use F here on hmm, what? Well, to get an input here, maybe we call it that bar. So we have to find some value bar, which is of type C. No, sorry, sorry, of type B. So why B? Well, because the input to F is of type B. Well, how can we define something of type B? Well, then we have to use the other function, the function G. So let's add that comment as well. So the function G takes an A and returns a B. So this bar is G applied to something of type A. Now, 
what do I have? Well, I actually have an X. I can apply G to X. Now let's try to see, variable not in scope. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have, I have to make this a local definition for foo. So foo where, whoops, where bar is equal to g of x. OK, now it's happy. So this is a little bit indirect. But what I was trying to say is that we have to create a function. That function takes an x, and it applies f to a result, which it gets from g. And now I can start using um, program calculation here. So we know that bar is equal to g of x. So I can just replace bar by g of x. OK, and now we can use the anonymous functions, the lambda expressions, to say that, well, actually, foo is equal to lambda x arrow f of g of x. That still type checks and works. And then if this should be foo and foo is this, we can just replace foo as well to make it a bit shorter. So what do we have here? We say that f composed with g, so f after g is the usual reading, is the function which takes an x as an input, sends it into g, and lets the result go into f. OK, and here it says redo f3 using dot. So let's split the screen a bit and search for f3. So we defined this function before. So I'll now move it down here and call it f3 prime. So if we look at the pattern here, we can see that, hmm, even if I even indent it similarly, we can see this is lambda x arrow f1 of f2 of x. So that should be possible to write with a new combinator, with a new dot here. So if we just rename f to f1 and g to g to f2, then we get exactly this. So we can say f1 dot f2. So now let's see if we can test the function. So we have f3 prime on 3.14, and we have f3 on 3.14. And not surprising, they do the same thing. So what have we done here? Well, we've implemented three polymorphic functions. And especially the last one is really useful in um, programming. You very often want to thread values through one, two, three, four functions. Uh, sometimes in shell scripts and so on, you use a bar, a pipe, a sign, a vertical bar for this. But here it's a dot. And uh, it really shows that you can work with functions as first class values. So dot takes two functions at input and returns a third function as an output. And we also mentioned in the uh, on the way there that it uses we also have laziness around, and that dot is a higher order function. OK, let's see time-wise. Yes, we can fit one more part. So this was part one, just polymorphic functions. And let's then move on to pairs. So a very common uh, concept in mathematics is Cartesian product. So here's the mathematical syntax. If you have two sets, A and B, you can form the set A cross B. And that is the all the ordered pairs of values X and Y, where X comes from A and Y comes from B. So the typical example, I mean, if we have the set 1, 2, and then we, I don't quite know how to create that unicode symbol, uh, cross it with, uh, say, A, B, and C. Then we'll get the pairs 1a, 2a, and 1b. Uh, Maybe if I line them up, it's easy to see the pattern. 1b, 2b, 1c, and 2c. So 
two times three values become six values. So the that's why it's called product. So the product of sets, the cardinality of the product is the product of the cardinalities. The number of elements is multiplied. So the Haskell syntax doesn't use this infix cross, uh, which is one of the Unicode characters that I don't quite know how to write, <laughs> but I can copy it at least. So the Haskell syntax instead uses the same parentheses as for the pairs. So the pair type a comma b has values as pairs x comma y, if x has type a and y has type b. So if I oops, uh, if I try to write here one comma hello, that's just a pair of an integer and a string. And well, I can I can ask for the type of this just to show that. Oh, yeah, it, it's a little bit more general than that. It doesn't have to be an integer. It could be some other kind of numeric type. But if I claim it's an integer, it will say it's an int and a string. OK, so then let's try to do some um, type-driven development again and implement the function fust, which is abbreviation for first, so the first component. And so first type says that if we have a pair of an A and a B, we should return an A. And already here, the name might give a hint, but the type forces the implementation. We have only one choice of a correct implementation here. And nicely, we have what is called pattern matching. As we know that the input function first is a pair, we can write, OK, it takes x and y as an input. And then it's question, what can we write here as the output? Well, the only value which is correct to write here is x, because x has type A, while y has type B. And those are the only polymorphic values we have in scope. So if we try this, it's sort of worked. And then we could say, what is first of this pair? Well, not surprisingly, it's the one. It extracts the first component, throws away the second one. And given that, it's not very surprising to see that we can also implement the other component. If we accidentally would write x here and try to load it, it will say, well, couldn't match expected type B with actual type A. And that gives lots of uh, suggestion for what to do about it. So this really has to be y. OK, and now that works. So now we can also do, we had first. We can also do a second on this pair to get the hello out. OK, so um, a little more complicated. We're building up towards more complicated functions. Um, the swap function has this type. It takes a pair of A and B and returns a B and a, a B A pair. So we can pattern match on X and Y. And not surprisingly, the only thing we can do on the right hand side is to return y and x in the opposite order. So now if we take the same value and swap, then we got hello one instead of one hello. And well, we could call swap twice if we want, then we get back the original pair. Okay, and similarly, uh, if we want to implement something like um, associativity of Cartesian products, so we, we have a pair of an A and another pair. We can move the things around to create a pair where the first component is a pair and C is alone instead. And here it's an X, a Y, and a Z. And there is very little choice. We have to produce an X and a Y followed by the Z. OK, these were warm, warm ups. And now we get to the more complicated version. So again, a higher order function. So we have to first try to read off the type here. So f to p, it's, it's a, well, it's not a very good name, perhaps. It's just a, something that takes a function and returns a pay, pair. So maybe we should say as a comment, function to pair of functions. Because the input, if we, uh, sorry, 
I wanted to to sort of erase some of the information here and say that, well, it takes something and returns two things. So that at least gives us the help that its input here, we can call it F. Um, so if we, we have one argument to the function F to P and we could call that, func that F. And notice F is in turn a function of this type. But then we're supposed to return a pair. So we can say, okay, it's a pair of foo and bar where foo equals something and bar equals something. Now we can try to see from the type up here what the types of these arguments are. So the first one Whoops. Foo has type A to B. And the second one, bar has type A to C. So we should, we should take a function as input and we ret should return two functions, foo and bar as output. Okay, how do we define a function? Well, we give it an argument, x. Actually, in both cases, we can give it an x. And then in both cases, that x is of type A. So we can have that as a comment here, x is of type A. And then we need to return something of type B in the first case. And now you might wonder, how do we get a hold of a B? The only thing we have is the function f. So if we call f, so we can make one example here, if we call f on x, that will have type b comma c. So that will be a pair, but then we can use our helpers here. So we can take first of that pair. So foo of x can be defined as first of f of x. And similarly, this should be the second of f of x. So we have locally defined two functions, foo and bar, and they both call the same helper f, but one takes out the first component and the other takes out the second component. Okay, uh, let's see if we can, well, okay, be before, before we, run it as an example, let's first try to make it a little shorter. And the reason I'm I'm working with shortening here is not necessarily that it needs to be very short, because it might also be difficult to read if it's short, but it's definitely easier to calculate with. So I can mention here program calculation. So just as you can do like x times a plus b um, equals x times a plus x times b, the distributive law. These kinds of calculations can also be done with programs in Haskell. And it's easier to do calculations if the programs are short. Program calculation is easier with short notation, with brief yeah, notation, I could say. So let's see if we can make this one slightly shorter. So first I can use the anonymous function trick. So this can be a function, lambda x to first, I'll also cut the comment here. And then bar similarly takes an x in and returns second of f of x. So this means I can replace the definition of foo with the right-hand side. And similarly, I can replace bar with this expression. And now it's a one-liner. I can make it a little bit better still because this pattern we've seen before. So if I split here and return a search back to the composition function. So remember we, we did this, we noted that, well, actually when we have a, a lambda expression, which applies one function after the other, we can just remove the lambda expression and use the dot infix instead. 
So in this case, it means that this lambda expression is the same as first composed with f. And this lambda expression is second composed with f. And now we truly have something short. So the whole function f to p takes a function in and returns the composition of first and the composition of second with that function. Okay, so this is trying to show that you, you can, um, by just having a polymorphic type, you can sometimes find the implementation and there is almost no choice at all. So the implementation here is forced by the polymorphic type. And still, this is a rather abstract type, so we may need to exemplify it. So I have some examples that we can use below. So let's cut this part and then try to see if we have some example. So I I got for example, uh, okay, this is this of the other side. Let's let's implement an example first then. So if I want to use f to p, I have to have a function that takes a value and returns a pair. So let's call my fun. Um, they take, say, an int and returns both a bool and uh, an int. So my fun of some value n is equal to even of n. So it checks if the, if the number is even or not. And n plus 1. OK, so my fun of 3 says false and four, and my fun of four says true and five. So this is a, a function which can be used with f to p. So test one equals f to p of my fun. So what, what is now test one? Well, test one is a pair of two functions from int to bool and from int to int. So we can say, for example, first, well, let's give them name names. Uh, so test one f for first is first of test one, and test one s for is second of test one. And then I can actually also um, insert the typings here. So test one is a function, well, it's a pair of functions, one from int to bool and one from int to int. And these then are of those types. Test one f, let's type int to bool and test one s, let's type int to int. So let's start, try test one f on three. It says false. Well, why? Well, because it's actually is really the, the even check. So it, it does it a little bit of a roundabout way. It first computes even and n plus one, and then checks if the result is even, if the first component is even or odd. But you, you may remember that we said that Haskell is lazy. So it, when we do this first component computation, we actually will not compute n plus one. It will only compute and check if the function is, if the value is even. And then test one s of three is four. So that's the, the function which takes n and adds one to it. Okay, um, I have a few minutes left. So let's do also the opposite function. So if we have a pair of functions from the same set A, we can create one function which computes both at once. So in this case, we got a pair. Actually, we can pattern match and say this is f and g. So we, we are creating, we are, we are given two functions f and g here, and then we should return a function from x to a pair of some high and ho where i equals something and ho equals something. 
Okay, so what's the type of high? High has type B. And ho has type C, the second component there. So we can maybe even indent this to see that things are sort of lined up nicely. So we have a, an X of type A and we want to produce an high of type B and a ho of type C. And the, the two things we've got in our sort of arsenal in our toolbox are F and G. Those are functions from A to B and from A to C. So clearly, if we want to produce a B value, we have to use the first function F. We can apply it to the X. And in the other case, we can apply the G function to the same X. And as you might see, there is not, not really any reason to have a separate where clause here. So I will now remove the where clause and insert the definitions directly to make the code a little shorter. Uh, and now we have a function p to f that takes a pair of functions f and g and produces one function which does both. And then we should be able to run. So I think we got an example down here of a pair, x1. So x1 is a pair of functions from integer to integer, integer to bool. Um, so we should be able to run p to f on x1. And it says, okay, yeah, sure. That one is a function, but the function needs an integer. So let's apply it to three, and then we get four and false. So notice here that we applied the higher order function to the example of two functions. We get the result, which we apply to three. So you can read this as p to f x1 applied to three. But Haskell doesn't require those parentheses to be in place, so it's enough to write directly p to f, x1, and 3. Um, OK, and now um, the final step here I want to illustrate, which is also related to calculation, is that we can combine these two functions, p to f and f to p. So take a function, create a pair, take the pair and create a function again. So let's see. Um, so I, I said this in the wrong way. P to F. Yeah, so take P to F creates from a pair of function and then it creates a pair again. So what here, which is like, okay, what on earth is this doing? What should be applied to a pair? So for example, this X1. And then it gives back something of the same type. So if we check what the type of x1 is, it has the same type. And in, in fact, it is the same pair. So how do we see that? Well, we could do a little calculation, uh, but we could also just test it. So what of x1 is a pair? So we can take the first component of this pair. That's a function. But we can apply it to 3, and we get 4. Or we can apply the second component to three and we get false. And false because it's not even. We had here the definition of the pair as the plus one function and the is even function. So basically x1 and x2 is the same pair, but they are a pair of functions that are not all that easy to compare. And I will now, uh, in the last few minutes uh, before we take a break, uh, illustrate why this, um, the fact that you get the identity function here, why that's relevant for, for calculating in a simple way as well. And that's because we can actually read these types as um, basically numerical expressions. So if I take this type into the comment, so pairs is basically a product type. 
So product means that this this is uh, if we take let's let's put it this way. So we we have, we've have written functions in both directions, both ways from a pair to. Oh, sorry. No, now I copied the wrong one. I wanted the this top one here. Okay. So we we've written functions in both directions between these two, and a arrow b can also be read as b to the power of a. And pairing can be read as multiplication. So this is to c to the power of a. So b to the power of a times c to the power of a equals, well, what do we have here? Here we have b times c to the power of a. So this expression here is about cardinality. So the number cardinality equals the number of elements in the types sets. So the number of functions from A to B is B to the power of A, if B is the, um, the number of values in the type B and A is the number of values. Maybe I should write capital A and B here to avoid confusion. So this is one of the exponentiation laws. If you want to multiply, if, if you have um, b times c to the power of a, well, b to b to the power of a and c to the power of a. So we, it's equal to b to the power of a times c to the power of a. So the, there is a, an interesting hidden correspondence here between certain type expressions for polymorphic types and algebraic identities, which will not um dive deeper into right now now but which i think is fascinating and uh, has lots of implication also something called the um the isomorphism between uh, sets okay we've reached now the end of part 2 here and i think it's a good time for a break especially since the schedule said that it would be an hour of lecture until 1700 and then another hour from 1730 but i'm uh, open for questions and comments if there is anything more okay <clears throat> welcome back after the break uh, there was uh, a few questions which were not heard, so I can mention just briefly that one question was about um, Turing completeness. Um, so Turing completeness is about can the language, and usually for a domain-specific language, it cannot. Um, completeness. Um, but I have so far not introduced any domain-specific language. So Haskell is a general purpose language and Turing complete. Um, but I will later uh, introduce a few sub languages which are definitely not Turing complete and uh, they are domain specific very small languages because we don't fit very much in this uh, mini course. <laughs> um, there was one more question which I have forgotten now, but uh, maybe it will pop up later. Okay, so a third part uh, about in this uh, little uh, introduction to Haskell um, by polymorphisms and types is some types. So uh, I was talking about pairs, which is a product type. So basically pairs are pairs and records are product types. And one way of explaining that is because the number of elements in the Cartesian product is the product of the number of elements in the subsets. So if you have the pairs of A and B, so there are, uh, so basically cardinality of A times cardinality of B is the cardinality of a comma b. So if you multiply the number of elements in a with the number of elements in b, you get the number of elements in the pairs of a and b. For some types, it's addition instead. 
So you you add values together instead of multiplying them. And um, the first example is a, a simple example that comes up often, the maybe type. So it's the, the idea that it's for situations where you maybe have a value of type A, but you're not sure. So you have to handle this if there is no value case in some way. And the data type declaration here is not finished, but it can be written as either you don't have anything, well, nothing, or you just have an A. And that syntax with the bar here means that there are two possible values, uh, two possible forms of values. So the set of values of maybe A is the set of the value nothing, and then just, so let's say, for example, maybe um, weekday, maybe weekday. So it's nothing, it's just Monday, just Tuesday, just Wednesday, and so on, up to just Sunday. So basically, uh, these are the values in the type maybe weekday. So we have the cardinality of weekday equals seven and the cardinality of maybe weekday equals one plus seven equals eight. So maybe the maybe type constructor takes a type A and adds one extra value called nothing. That's often used when, when you need some kind of error handling or some default value. You may have a data stream, but sometimes there is no value coming in, and then you have to substitute that with something. And then you can use the nothing constructor, and then later you might fill it in. And there is a standard function that's used for maybe types, which is called maybe with a lowercase m. And it has a bit of a scary type, but this again is designed to have only one correct implementation. So maybe takes a default value, which I call def, and some action function, I called action here. And then it takes a value of type maybe a, so mx, and then it should return some value of type b. And now I would use what is called pattern matching again. Before I used pattern matching on pairs, now I use pattern matching on a sum type. And what happens is basically, instead of writing just one definition here, I write two. I say, well, this is either nothing, nothing, in this course, in which case I return the default value, or it's just X, in which case I return action applied to X. So <clears throat> this is the, um, sort of only type correct definition we can make. And the reason I've included this action is just to make sure that I cannot uh, make any mistakes. So the A here in the maybe type, I cannot just return it. I have to do something with it. And that's the action. Uh, a typical example you might want to protect against is say division by zero. So safe div perhaps, if you get then two integers, and then you want to produce an integer and you want to divide. Well, then it's a bit difficult. You might do a maybe int and say, if the first is called x and the second is zero, then you say nothing. And if you have x and any, well, any value else other than zero, then you can say just div x y or well now this will not be <laughs> uh, quite type correct here oh parse error i i forgot uh, one of the colons because integers cannot be divided there there so i i'll if i want to do this i should replace int by double instead so floating point numbers okay and now now it works now it will check if the second value is zero, in which case it will return nothing, and otherwise just the actual division. Um, now, it's not very 
practical perhaps for, for numerics to do this because you get this maybe constructor in the way, but there are lots of other cases where you have an error value you want to introduce. Okay, so that was whoops, uh, the sort of maybe type. And then the last example is the either type. So either is a generalization. It's basically, so basically A plus B. So it's a union or um, disjoint union, also sometimes called a tagged union. So either AB is a type which is either left A or right B. And what does it mean? Well, uh, I should have this kind of example again. So the type either week, day, whoops, weekday bool. Well, let's, let's put it the other order. Either bool weekday contains the values left false, left true, right Monday, right Tuesday, and so on up to right Sunday. Maybe I should indent it suitably. And you can see that the cardinality, the number of elements in this either bool weekday is the cardinality of bool plus the cardinality of weekday equals two plus seven equals nine. So the same case setting as we had before, but for addition instead of multiplication. And this is when you want to, to uh, store different kinds of values, for example, in a list, then you can combine them in this way. Um, I will not go into defining this either function here. It's very similar to the maybe function above, and it has the same kind of pattern of only one choice being possible to make. Because I want to get over to something a little more mathematical and start getting closer to our first real DSL embedded in Haskell. So I will move to another file complex. So, so this file is again some live coding. It's from the chapter one of the book. Uh, it's from week one of the course. Um, I've inlined a few quotes from an actual math books, uh, math book, um, the calculus book by Adams and Essex that the computer science students were taking in their maths course, which was they took before this course. And I'm trying to, well, you could say, make fun of the math book a bit here. It might be a little bit evil because I'm really reading the math book as the devil reads the Bible. I'm trying to find anything which seems strange and trying to sort of uh, really read every letter and, and find out what it means. So um, the first quote here, um, Right, and the aim of this is to introduce some Haskell and some coding and to at, after half of the um, of this appendix of complex numbers, we will get to implementing a domain specific language for complex numbers. But the first quote says, uh, actually the quote is from my book, which in turn quotes Adams and Essex. So the indented part, we begin, that's the quote from the math book. So it says, we begin by defining the symbol i called the imaginary unit to have the property i squared equals minus one. Thus, we could call i the square root of minus one and denote it square root of minus one. And then it says, of course, i is not a real number. No real number has a negative square. Okay, so I'm trying now to see if we can implement something in Haskell, which step-by-step step will build up towards being able to compute with, with complex numbers. But so far from this very little, uh, this five line quote here, the only thing we know is that we got something called an imaginary unit. It says it is not a real number, but it does not say that it is a complex number. So. 
mentioned complex numbers, strictly speaking. <laughs> um, strictly speaking. So therefore, I introduce another data type called imagunit. So this is the name of the type, and iu is the name of the constructor of a value of that type. So if we want to write this as that before, so imag unit is basically equal to the set of only one element, and that's iu for imaginary unit. OK, and then I define a lowercase i, which is equal to iu. And the, the reason for not writing little lowercase i here is that Haskell does not allow data type constructors to be lowercase letters. So this is a bit of a annoying detail. But anyway, iu is now an imaginary unit, and little i is the same as iu. So I can choose to use little i if I want to. So this quote leads me to introduce this new type. And it's often useful when you get to a mathematical concept, or for that matter, something else that you need to implement, a communication standard or a, or a, a trading rules for some monetary exchange to take the definitions and try to represent them as types. So let's see. We have this type, and then we go to quote number two in the book. Then they say what a complex number is. OK, this is a little bit strange, but we'll try to deal with it step by step. So it says a complex number is an expression of the form a plus bi or a plus ib, where a and b are real numbers and i is the imaginary unit. OK, so i was the unit we had before, and now they're saying a complex number can be written in two ways. OK. Um, I've tried to code that up here in Haskell and saying the data type CB, so version B of complex numbers. I actually had a version A before, but I've skipped it now. It has two constructors. There are two different ways, just like left and right in the either type. So the first form, hmm, this was written in Swedish before, second form. Um, the first form um, has two real numbers and an imaginary unit, and then it becomes a complex number. And the other one has a real number, an imaginary unit, and a real number in that order. So the examples here is 3 plus 4i could be represented as plus i1, 3, 4i, and 3 plus i4 is 3i4 with the plus i2 constructor. So there are two different constructors, two different ways of building complex numbers. I mean, for anyone who actually knows what complex numbers are, this is a bit strange. I mean, why should we care if the 4 and i are in, in one order or the other? But so far, we just try to use the definition. And for some reason, the definition talks about an expression of one of these two forms. Perhaps this means that multiplication, the bi and ib, is actually not commutative. So it might be that bi is not equal to ib. We don't know. So let's be sure here and encode both of them. We should also notice that they have not said that uh, numbers, so let's see here, note that bi plus a is not of the right form, which is a bit strange. I mean, we would expect bi plus a to also be a complex number. But if we strictly want to look at this definition, it only says there has to be a real number, a plus sign, a b and an i, or a real number, a plus sign, an i, and another real number. bi plus a is not. Then. You would expect addition to be associated uh, or to be commutative, so you can swap the orders. But so far, strictly speaking, that hasn't been introduced. Okay, so we got these two constructors and we got two example values. Let's try to see if, whoops, now I have accidentally closed my Emacs window, so I should open it again. <laughs> Complex.
The good that I got this cheat sheet down here that checks my font size. Okay, complex numbers back there. And then I image mode. Okay, quote back. So what I wanted to do, <laughs> where I accidentally closed my Emacs buffer, I wanted to, to check what the evaluator says with C1 and C2. So this, this prints 3 plus 4i and 3 plus i4. And how does it do the printing? Well, actually, this is another example of a Haskell function defined by pattern matching. So show cb is a function that takes a cb value, which has either this or that form, and then produces a text representation, a, a text string. It shows the value a, a plus sign shows b, and the i character. And, and so on. And then it helps, it, it tells Haskell that anytime you want to show a value of this type, use this function show CB. So that's just for convenience. Okay, and then we get some examples. This is the third quote. Now this gets a little bit interesting, especially as we said that BI plus A and so on is not the right form. Here we continue with examples. 3 plus 2i, okay, that seems fine. We can we can write that. Here is the that example, 3, 2, i, u, and the plus 1 form. But then comes something strange. 7 halves minus 2 third i. Notice that this is not of the form. That's, I, I have to split this one so that we can see the quote and the, the second quote at the same time. This has a minus sign in the middle, so it is not an expression of this form. So according to the math book's own definition, this example of a complex number is not a complex number. So clearly that is not what they mean. As they claim that this is a complex number, there must be some rule which makes this reasonable. And you can guess the rule uh, that if there is a minus sign, they mean the same as having an addition and then a negative coefficient. So this 7 half plus minus 2 thirds i is what they mean. But it's a bit tricky that they actually don't include the minus sign in the definition of complex numbers. So I think this is an example of a math author who has not really thought about the difference between syntax and semantics. It sounds like they're introducing a syntax here, syntactic plus sign, the order of B and I and so on. But in fact, that's not what they mean. Okay, the order that the second example here did not match. So we have to be a little kind and interpret this as plus a negative uh, real number times I. Then they got this example, I pi. And that's definitely not of this form. There is no i and there is no plus. But then they say explicitly, well, when we write i pi, we mean 0 plus i pi. So then we can notice here that we can represent this third example with the second constructor. Notice why the second constructor? Well, because the i is before the b. OK, and then the last example, minus 3 which is also definitely not of this form. There is no i, there is no plus sign. Well, then they mean, they define it to mean minus three plus zero i. So these, these conventions are all fairly normal, but it's interesting to see that they do not really explain these, rather the opposite. They say that these are the only complex numbers and then they suddenly introduce numbers which do not form to follow this form. So unfortunately, this is not a common in math books. You will have to be very careful in reading between the lines. You will have to see, OK, what do we think they really mean instead of what they actually say? Anyway, if we are a bit kind here and interpret these things in the right way, this is the four examples they've got. So the last example there was minus 3 plus 0i. So we have. Now this E1 and E2 and E3 and E4. And as you can see, um, implementations in the computer are approximate. So we will only get a finite number of digits approximation of two thirds, for example. And pi also is just a, a finite number of 
of digits. Okay, so, so far so good. We've introduced some examples and this type. Quote number four. Um, this is a bit of a strange comment. We will normally use A plus BI unless B is a complicated expression, in which case we will write A plus IB instead. Either form is acceptable. Now, if we compare with the quote up here, quote number one, it's said that a complex number is of either these form. So of course, either form is acceptable. It would be silly to first say that both forms are acceptable and then say that either form is acceptable. So they actually mean something else. So what they actually mean here is that either form is equal to the same complex number. It's not only acceptable, they are equal. So what they're suddenly saying here is that, well, we said that there are two forms of complex numbers, but we didn't really mean it. In reality, there are lots of forms. You can use a plus, you can use a minus, you can use no A and no B and so on. And there are certain rules for equality, but there are no different forms. There is just one form in the internal representation of complex numbers, and that has two real numbers, one of them being the real part and one being the imaginary part. And this is a bit tricky because you will have to read that between the lines. They don't say it in the book. So you will have to see, oh, either form is acceptable. It cannot possibly mean, strictly speaking, that they are acceptable because that's already clear. It must mean something else. And we interpret it as being these two forms are interchangeable. Whenever you have A plus BI is equal to A plus IB. And what we have, they haven't written, but we can also infer is that actually A plus IB is also equal to IB plus A. So the order of addition is also uh, possible to change. So we can use this to implement a new type data CC here. Notice that CB and CC, so I, I would sort of give up on CB that I had before and now use only CC um, because it's easier to program with just one constructor. And then what this, instead of acceptable, if you read it as interchangeable, that means that we can check the equality of two complex numbers, one having real part A, imaginary part B, and one having real part X, imaginary part Y, by checking that A is equal to X, the real parts are the same, and B is equal to Y, the imaginary parts are the same. So this is a Haskell definition, which makes us possible to do equality check of say, plus I one zero and plus I zero one. And it will say false because those are not the same complex numbers. But if we would say uh, one and say one minus one, that's true. So that those two complex numbers are the same. One minus one is zero, so that's zero and one equals one. Okay, we move on. Um, it's often convenient to represent a complex number by a single letter. W and Z are frequently used for this purpose. Now this first sentence is a little bit strange here. I mean, of course, it's convenient to represent a complex number by a single letter. We can represent functions by a single letter, real numbers by a single letter. Anything in mathematics can be abbreviated to a single letter. It has nothing to do with complex numbers. So I think it's a little bit misplaced to say that we can represent a complex number by a single letter. It might be helpful to say that W and Z are frequently used because in the math books, they rarely give types. But here they say that, well, if you see W or Z, you should be suspicious that these are perhaps not real numbers or integers. They are probably complex numbers. Okay, that's the first sentence. That's already information. The second sentence says that if A, B, X, and Y are real numbers, and we have a complex 
a name of a complex number w, which is a plus bi, and z, which is x plus yi, then we can refer to the complex numbers w and z. Well, we can refer to them or we cannot refer to them, but of course it should work. They have already introduced these forms up here, a plus bi and x plus yi. And then it says also what we already implemented as the equality check. W equals Z if and only if A equals X and B equals Y. And that was precisely what we wrote here. A equals X and B equals Y. So here, finally, they say that, well, there is only one way of writing the real number, the complex numbers, and they only have two important components, both real numbers. Okay, finally, they've introduced this notation of W and Z, and they want to define the first help, little helper function on real numbers, or on complex numbers. So they say definition. If Z equals X plus YI is a complex number, where X and Y are real, they have to be explicit here because they could be complex, that would be complicated. We call X the real part of Z and denote it by Re of Z. And we call y the imaginary part and denoted by m of z. And then they say, this is basically using pattern matching. They say the real part of z is the real part of x plus y i with just the x. And the imaginary part is the y. And if we want to implement that, this is perhaps uh, a little unfamiliar syntax, but we're saying here the real, so first, okay, we use re and m with the lowercase i, and that's again due to a limitation in Haskell. Normal function definitions can only start with a lowercase letter. So I have to, I can't really implement the re with a capital R here. I have to write re with a small r. But they, they have a type. They take a complex number to a real number. Both re and m do that. And then I can pattern match. I can say the real part of z and this at sign means basically this equality here, uh, saying z is actually equal to plus i of x and y. And that whole uh, definition of this function reapplied to z is the x part of the real number. So I bind three variables, z, x, and y, and I ignore the value of z and y, and I return x, and similarly for m. So if I now want to test what is the real part of plus i one zero, not very surprisingly, it's one and the imaginary part is zero. Okay, and then a first use of pattern matching in more interesting case, the sum and difference of complex numbers. So let's see if we can implement addition of complex numbers. So first the type here, which they don't write in the math book, while they write it in text. They say, if W and Z are complex numbers, then they describe how you get a new complex number as their sum. So here we can say, well, you take two complex numbers and you return a new complex number. So two inputs, one output, that's how to read the type. So the two inputs we should write here, so we can call them W and Z. But actually, we know that W must be, um, we can scroll down a bit up here. It must be of this type CC. There it is. It must be the constructor plus I. So we can say W is a plus I of the used here A and B. And Z is actually a plus I of x and y. So now we've copied this text and the left-hand side of the definition. And then we have to produce an answer, something else than error. So this should be plus i of two expressions. And the first we just read off there, a plus x, and the second is b plus y. Okay, let's now try this. Um, we have add cc of plus one zero plus zero one. 
Okay, I forgot it was called plus plus i in both cases. Okay, so if you plus plus i one zero with zero one, we get plus i one one. Okay, not very surprising. Um, we're I should remove this one. We have sort of step by step now built up a few example functions and data types that represent <clears throat> what's actually the semantics. So we can say down here, we define semantic complex numbers in Cartesian form. And now we will turn to the first DSL, the syntactic complex numbers. So I mentioned earlier that the DSL has three parts that we will look at, an abstract syntax type, which we will call CE, complex expression, complex expression, that what C and E comes from. And then we have the semantic type CEC, which we already introduced. And then we should write an evaluator, eval, that translates an expression to just a complex number, semantics. <clears throat> so I've here already written the data type definition and we'll try to explain it. So this is a recursive data type. So the data type CE consists of basically trees. So we, we can we can give some example expressions here. I think I got E1. No, oh, those were before, up, up there. Okay, so let's let's take let's write some expressions ourselves. So complex expression one is of type C. So it can be add I I. So CE1 here is add I, I. So that's just a syntax tree. It doesn't really have any meaning so far. And we can define, well, we can take more examples here, C3, C4, all being of type CE. So CE2 could be mal I, I. CE3 could be add CE1 and CE2. And CE4, well, what should we take? Um, you could say add R con two and I. So R con two, the intention here is real constant. So the, the, the idea is that every real number can be treated as a complex number. So basically this is called embedding real constants. So this converts a real number into a complex number expression. Okay, so all of these examples, CE1, CE2, CE3, CE4, they are just expressions. It says there, add of add ii and mol ii. It doesn't evaluate to anything, it just is. It's a tree-like structure. It's it's a bit of like a, a very small program. It says that, well, I would like to compute the addition of CE1 and CE2, but I, I haven't done it yet. It's just an expression. Okay, um, and then we want to evaluate this. We want to write the function that takes a complex expression and return a complex number. So, there are four different cases, and uh, we will start with the simplest one, or maybe the second simplest one, i. So how do we construct a value of type cc that should represent this? Well, I will split the screen here. I will search for data cc. So we can see that cc has one constructor plus i. So the answer here must be plus i something something question mark question mark so the real part and the imaginary part as real numbers so zero and one okay so we have now implemented the first case of the evaluator we can now write eval of i and that's plus i zero one well 
not very fun. I mean, if you try to evaluate anything else, like evaluate our first example, for example. Um, no, not E1, CE1. It will say to do, because this is not implemented yet. Addition is not implemented. But let's try to do it. Let's, let's move to addition. And here is what where I would like to uh, use wishful thinking. So it's a design pattern for writing recursive functions. So assume that we've already solved the problem of adding complex numbers. And we call that function add cc. Because we, we have, we, we've already implemented add cc. I think it's here. So we have a function that would take, uh, so this one needs two cc values. So values of type, of type cc. So how do I get a value of type cc? Well, we can call ourselves recursively. We can evaluate E1 and we can evaluate E2. So if we recursively go through this syntax tree and evaluate the first component and we evaluate the second component, those will be two CC values and they can be added using add CC. So that means that now we should be able to evaluate CE1. So notice CE1 itself is add ii, but eval of CE1 has real part zero in imaginary part two. So it just added up plus i zero one and plus i zero one to plus i zero two. So we can here step by step try to introduce what it should be doing in the different cases. And in this case, for example, the r con, that's a plus i with the real part r an imaginary part zero. That's what I mean. That's what is generally meant by embedding real numbers as complex numbers. So with that in place, let's see, is any of the three, four? Ah, yeah, we should be able to do evaluate CE4. So this is now plus I two and one. So notice that well, CE4 here has a real, com a completely real number, 2, and then it completely imaginary number, one, i. So this just becomes 2 plus i. I mean, this is uh, real part 2, imaginary part 1. OK, so the only thing remaining here is multiplication. But we can already uh, implement it structurally we can say well it has to be the multiplication of evaluation of the left and evaluation of the right or the first and the second arguments so the form of it is already clear and the type is actually also clear so we had add cc before and now we only need to implement mul cc and i will now forget these so that we can get the <clears throat> exercise of filling them in ourselves. But what what we do know already, well okay, let's 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 cut even more first just to see how is this is done in similar way as we done uh, in the other Haskell intro file. So we need to take two complex numbers as input. Notice here there are complex numbers, not complex number expressions. So they are both of the form plus i, say a, b, and plus i, x, y. And then we have to write plus i something real and something imaginary. And we can locally define the real part and the imaginary part. And if we manage to find definitions here, then the evaluator will recursively do the right thing. And usually the way this is done, uh, let's let's make a comment here locally and say, well, if we have, now I will write sort of mathematics in Os Haskell for a little while. So A plus I B 
or A plus BI. This is supposed to be the multiplication of A plus BI and X plus YI. And we know by distributivity, oops, that this has, it will be four different terms. So it would be AX plus AYI plus BYX plus BIYI. Right. Now I just multiplied um, them without writing multiplication signs because it isn't in mathematics, it's elided. So the key now, so this is distributivity. I'm just trying to argue now why the definition, what, what the definition should be. Okay, and then say uh, simplify. So when I said simplify, um, I want to collect terms in a po polynomial in I. So this first term, AX, doesn't have any I, so it's it's a zero degree polynomial. And then we have AY plus BX times I. So that's the sort of linear term. And then we have BY times I squared. So that's a polynomial in I. And then we know I squared equals minus one plus simplify. So then we can say, well, this is actually AX minus BY plus this. So we have now an expression of the form that they were talking about before in the in the first quote, actually. Let's see if we can fit it in here. Ah, I shouldn't have split it so much. This is the... Uh, AX. Okay, so now it's on the form some real number plus some real number times i. So now I can use this um, to say the real part is ax minus by. I just have to come back to Haskell and notice that multiplication needs a letter. And similarly here, ay plus bx with multiplication signs. So this is the motivation for why it should say that. Okay, so, and and uh, I've just introduced these names, real and emag, but you know from before that I can also splice them in. We don't have to have these this separate names if you don't want to. Okay, now it should be possible to evaluate all our examples. So E1, uh, EC1, no, what was it? CE1. <laughs> okay, so CE1 is the first. And then we should evaluate CE2. Okay, now this is interesting. So CE2, that's the multiplication of I. So that's basically I squared, which should be equal to minus one. And we can see here, it has the real part minus one and the imaginary part zero. So that's an indication that we did the right thing in implementing mal CC here. Because clearly we could we could make a mistake. It might be plus here. If we do make that mistake, Haskell will not complain, but it would just do the wrong thing. Now suddenly i squared is equal plus one. Well, that's not good. <laughs> so Haskell will not do magic. It will not discover what you intended to implement unless you make sufficiently polymorphic types. Okay, so that was CE2. We should evaluate CE. Three. So that's the sum of CE1 and CE2, and that has real part minus one, imaginary part two, and then finally evaluation of CE4. Well, we've seen that before, that's plus uh, two, one. 
Okay, so we've now managed to implement. Um, yeah, this was perhaps stupid to have inside the code block. I can make it outside the code block instead. So the exercise here of implementing multi-CC has been done. Um, we've got a complete evaluator which recursively traverses this tree, which could be quite large. I mean, if I if I do CE5, which is the multiplication of CE2 and CE2, and then CE6, which is the multiplication of CE5 with CE5. So CE6 here is the multiplication of multiplication. Blah, blah. Yeah, it, it's a big multiplication. It's actually i to the power of 8. But evaluating it is no problem, and it becomes plus 1. Actually, interesting detail of, of floating point numbers. It, it actually has the, re, the imaginary part minus 0, which is equal to 0, but it looks a bit fishy. OK, so if you sum this up, uh, we have implemented a DSL, uh, a very, very simple language. And this is the, the complex expressions language, which has addition, multiplication, embedding of real constants, and the imaginary units. And with that, you cannot express everything in the complex numbers. I mean, you, I haven't got square roots or sine or cosine or ex exponentials and so on. But it's, it's, it's showing the basic structure of how to implement a small language. You add syntax, syntactic constructors, add Malcorn and so on. And then you write an evaluator, uh, which will, using wishful thinking, which should basically recursively call itself, would implement addition, multiplication, and so on, and translate these syntax trees into basically, in this case, pairs of real numbers, which is the internal representation, the semantic representation of the complex numbers. OK, now um, I think uh, this is enough because there is another topic that starts after this. So I think I'll take questions here.